So I'm Sean Ray, uh, and Sanj had asked me to show up today and talk to you about the Meraki backend, um, what happens kind of behind the covers on Dashboard. Um, just briefly about me, uh, I have a PhD in distributed systems from UC Berkeley. Uh, I was doing a postdoc at MIT when I met Sanjit and John, the founders of Meraki. Um, I didn't join Meraki when they started. Uh, it was wireless. I don't know anything about wireless. Didn't then. Still know a lot less than a lot of people at Meraki. Um, but I do know about building large, scalable systems. And by about November 2007, they were starting to have one of those. And uh, they convinced me to leave research and come join them. Um, I've been there ever since. And uh, in January 2010, I was made officially the head of our back-end scalability and performance team. So that's kind of my background. Um, what I want to talk about today is, well, I can talk about a bunch of things. Uh, what I mainly want to talk about today is some tools that we've built that allow us to do the kind of things that we've done with Dashboard as quickly as we've been able to do them. Tools that allow Meraki to be really agile and to ship features quickly and come up with completely new features quickly and get those out and so forth. Um, there's a sort of related talk that Sanjit sort of alluded to, which is the actual feature design process that goes on at Meraki. And the tools that I'm talking about uh, are related to that and enable that, but I don't have a whole bunch of slides about that. But if you want to hear about it, ask me at the end, and I can kind of extrapolate a bit for you. So to start talking about the back end, See if I can get rid of this cursor. Um, from 1,000 feet away, the cloud architecture that we have is reasonably straightforward. We take the set of customers that we have, partition them up, and assign any given partition to a particular server. Uh, we call that server a shard. We also call the partition a shard. The term is a dual use. Um, it's effectively a 1U rated server. It's got two disk arrays, both rated, and a 1U backup in a completely different data center. Um, the, data, the separate data center, in fact, is uh, given to us by a different provider. We lease both machines. So we have data center new, uh, redundancy, provider redundancy, um, and city redundancy. It's, in fact, it's in a different city. So it can and has happened where we've had a data center completely lose power, and we just swap over to the other one. And this is how we can give people the peace of mind that you know, even given that sort of large calamity, we can keep their uh, management uh, and configuration interface available. Hopefully not using Amazon. <laughs> um, yeah, especially not the northern data, yeah, yeah. Uh, northern Virginia data center. Um, we do actually use Amazon in some cases. Uh, they're our tertiary backup for a lot of data. We encrypt things and store them in S3 <coughs> um, just because it's a, a wonderful storage interface. Um, and we're using them actually to get geographic uh, distribution at this point. So they have data centers in Tokyo, in Ireland, in Sao Paulo. And we're using that to move it to them. But in the US, we're not on Amazon, no. Um, also, one of these shards is special. We call it the master. It basically acts as a demultiplexer. So when you go to dashboard.meraki.com and log in, you're talking to the master. It immediately redirects you to some shard. If you do it, you'll see like N14 in your browser URL. That's the shard that you're on at that moment. Um, kind of example of what a representative shard looks like. We're talking thousands of Meraki devices checking in with that. So this thing is massively multi-tenant. You're not the only person on that particular server at all. There's hundreds of thousands of clients per day checking in with those devices. And it works out to about 300 gigabytes of stats, statistics on any one server. And those go back uh, at least a year in almost every class of statistic that we gather. Um, and more importantly, perhaps, we're gathering new data from every one of our devices every 45 seconds. Um, if you're actually looking at the device in Dashboard, we're gathering it every single second. Um, but even if you're not looking at it, we're gathering every 45. So that when you go to diagnose a problem later, you can say, oh, wow, I have a lot of resolution here. And I can figure out kind of exactly what went wrong. The challenges in building a, uh, a system like this, there's three big ones, um, two of which I'm going to talk about in detail today. The first one is how do we talk to all these devices? Right? If you're talking about a wireless access point somewhere in this building, that almost certainly does not have a public IP address. Right? You can't just like, you know, send in a message via RPC. So we have this system called mTunnel, which allows us to talk to all of our devices, even if they're behind NATs. Um, it's super efficient. It sends and receives one packet every 25 seconds from every one of our access points. Uh, moreover, 
on the back end, it's what we call a resilient overlay network in the sense that if your device can't talk to one of our shards, but it can talk to another, the shards know how to route amongst each other and get connectivity to that device. So we can still gather statistics. We can still help you configure it. Another problem is how do you gather those statistics that frequently? You know, when I said we're talking about thousands or even tens of thousands of these devices checking in with a single shard, and we want to get all of their most recent information every 45 seconds, that's a pretty serious system in terms of network communication. We want to minimize the network overhead, both for our own servers, because we pay for it, and for our customer. You don't want to use your whole uplink sending us statistics. And we also want to minimize CPU costs for us. Right? The more of these things we can pack onto a shard, the lower the cost to us, and we can pass that on. And it's one of the things that makes um, the sort of cloud solution really cost effective. And then finally, we've got to store and retrieve all that data quickly. Uh, as I said, it's extremely high resolution data. We need some way to dump all of that stuff on disk, keep it around for years in case people want to get back at it, and at the same time, pull it out without spending like you know tons of money on SSD arrays. Can you give uh, us any information on the custom secure tunnel? Can yes. You guys yeah, exactly. yeah, I was just ask that. Yeah. <laughs> what about? I, can you tell us more about, did, did you develop it internally? Yes. Yeah, this was absolutely one of the first things that Meraki built. Um, it looks sort of like an IPsec VPN between the devices in our back end, except as I said, it, it implements a resilient overlay network so that it's not directly point to point. It may route through a second shard in order to get to the shard that it's trying to talk so to. So it's using AES encryption? Kind of yes. Thing. Yeah. yeah, it's fully encrypted. And then on top of that, the devices talk SSL over it, which is unnecessary given that the tunnel's encrypted, but it's it doesn't hurt. So each AP would ship with a certificate? Sorry, say again? Each AP would ship with a certificate on yes, it? Yes, with a secret on it. That's right. Um, yes, and I'm sorry, I don't have a whole bunch of detailed slides about that. I'm mostly going to talk about these two other. But um, this was, as I said, it was one of Meraki's first kind of innovations in this space. Are the, uh, the traffic sets you're talking about, they're the same for the switching platforms and the security platforms yes. as well? Yes. All of this backend infrastructure is shared across all of our all things. Um, for the systems manager client, there's a few little differences. But by and large, um, everything is shared. So you're doing the same thing on the, uh, on the system manager client for the, for the, for the Yeah, the tunnel, well. the tunnel technology is a little different on systems manager. Okay. But um, all the rest of the back end is the same. OK, so the first thing I want to talk about in detail is a system called POTR. Uh, POTR is the thing that allows us to gather all of these statistics as quickly as we do. Um, POTR is a relatively new system at Meraki. It was developed in, I think, the spring of 2009. And then we recently rewrote it um, completely in the spring of 2011. Um, so at this point, it's about a fourth generation system, all trying to do the same thing. The very first approach that we did, I've sort of um, simplified a bit on this slide. The idea was that every one of our devices, uh, the access points, for example, would run a small web server. And that web server would have you know, various URLs you could poke that say, like, show me all the usage information, or show me which clients are currently connected, <coughs> or you know, show me what you think your uplink bandwidth is, that sort of thing. And then every shard would run these grabber demons, which was a little C++ process that sat around and made TCP connections over the tunnel to each of these devices and over HTTP downloaded these statistics. And the statistics were encoded as XML. Um, this is great. It's really easy to build. right? This is like Web App 101. Uh, everybody knows how to build this. There's tons of tools to do it. Um, and implementation-wise, it's pretty simple. You've got one process for each grabber, and you've got n plus two threads, where there's like a thread that reads from the database a thread that writes into the database, and then a whole bunch of threads to parallelize your network I.O. Very easy to build. It's the kind of thing you build in like a junior year systems class in undergraduate CS course. The great thing about it is, like I said, it's simple. It's easy to write. It's blocking code. And XML is unstructured. So when you want to add new statistics, you just kind of throw them in there um, on the firmware side. And then the back end learns how to read them whenever it gets around to it. <laughs> on the other hand, it's really expensive at scale. So if you just do a simple HTTP <coughs> fetch to an absolutely empty web page, you're talking about 10 packets total that go back and forth and 510 bytes that get sent. On top of that, every one of these grabbers that we had, one for each type of statistic, was doing its own fetch. So we have like dozens of grabbers 
And so you're talking about, you know, every time we want to talk to one of your devices, you know, 12 kilobytes worth of data gets shipped. And on top of that, all of these threads puts a lot of load on the CPU because it's doing contact switches. And the combination of the network cost there and the CPU cost really limited us to where we could do something like one fetch from every access point every 10 minutes. The high level point is pretty obvious, right? When there's something wrong with your network, a resolution of 10 minutes is really frustrating, right? When we first built it, it was amazing. It was like, oh my gosh, this stuff's all on a web page. I don't have to set up my own SNMP server. This is genius, you know? But then after a while, you gotta find a way to up your game. And this just isn't enough. So Poder is a more high performance approach. Um, as I said, this is kind of a fourth generation system at this point. And I've got a bit of an animation to show kind of the basic idea on how we change things. So we start off with access points over here on the left side of the page. And the first thing we built was an event-driven RPC engine. So this is actually just a single thread. It does blocking I or non-blocking I.O., uh, you know, relatively tricky code to get right. Um, and it's able to talk to, I think when we first benchmarked it, we could talk to like 10,000 devices in 20 seconds. Um, on top of that, it uses UDP and Google protocol buffers, which are a binary encoding format. So the cost went way down in terms of the size of the packets and the number of packets. Then for each of the type of statistics that we want to gather, we write a separate module. This is one that gathers, say, LLDP information from switches about what they're plugged into. Um, each of those modules has its own thread, and there can be any number of them. Um, when the system starts up, there's a database which I'll talk about in a minute. All of these devices read information out of the database to figure out which, who they want to talk to. For example, uh, some grabbers only are interested in switches. Others are only interested in wireless po access points. And so they figure that out when they first start up. Then they operate in a pipeline where we take a request object, pass it through each of these modules, and say, hey, what would you like to ask the access point about? And they each append a little bit of a question to that packet. It gets shipped out by this event-driven RPC system, comes back from the device, and the response comes through all the modules again. And finally, we write that data to the database. So each request is, could potentially be different per AP? Or Absolutely. Or whatever. Absolutely. So the things that go to switches do not look like the things that go to access points at this point. They'll share a lot of common functionality, like when did you last reboot, for example. That's common across everything. Um, but we get all kinds of great parallelism in here. One, because this is doing non-blocking operations. And two, because each of these has its own thread. We scale out to the number of CPUs because we, like I said, we have a dozen grabbers here that easily um, fills up all of our CPUs. So as I said, it's a fetch thread and then just one thread per thing. We're using UDP. We're using protocol buffers. Each of these modules is actually really simple to write. It's a small chunk of Scala code. Um, Scala is a modern language that's based on Java. Um, works out to about two to 400 lines. A good first project for a new Meraki engineer is we make them write a new one of these modules. We just come up with a statistic that we know the firmware knows about that we're not currently gathering onto the back end and say, hey, it's your job to do this. Um, and the best part about it is because they have their own thread, there's no locking or synchronization issues to worry about. It's just straight line code. It's very easy for people who aren't used to writing highly multi-threaded servers to write these still. Um, and finally, because we're aggregating the request and responses from all these different modules in, together, and because we're using UDP, and because it's a binary format, we're now talking about two packets and only 48 bytes for an empty request and an empty response. So the efficiency is something like 10 times more than the previous system. Um, and ever since we deployed Poder, we've been fetching every 45 seconds instead of every 10 minutes. So we got a pretty big improvement in terms of customer visibility and the granularity of data. That, of course, though, brings up its own problem, which is what are we going to do with all that data, right? Um, I believe most of you have seen demos of Dashboard. This is our client's information page. Um, you know, I've got here a list of all the applications that are, have been seen on my network by the Meraki access points. Here I've got a graph of all the data that was transferred. This lower line, which it's a bit of an eye chart, you can't quite see probably from the back of the room, is all the traffic that was YouTube traffic. And this is a pie chart which shows you know, what other kinds of traffic did we see and what were its relative proportions on the network. Um, 
the interesting things to see from a scalability point of view, uh, this covers, what is this, it's a, about a month, just shy of a month, I think it's 30 days worth of data on this graph. There are about 20 applications that we're showing, but there are pages and pages of applications that you can scroll down into. And there are uh, 3,600, roughly, client devices represented on this one page. So the challenge is, one, where do we store all this? And two, how do we get it back out quickly enough to draw this page in a hurry? Um, just some kind of back of the envelope numbers. 3,600 clients assume that each client is using about 10 applications. I made that number up, but it's a pretty reasonable number in terms of the data we see. You say gather you know, three new records per application per hour because they don't change all that often. And 72 bytes a record, you're talking about 63 gigabytes per year. And that is for that one customer's network. And that is one of many customers hosted on this shard. Um, your standard online transaction processing database, Postgres, MySQL, it's not very hot at clustering. If your entire working set fits in RAM, it's really, really fast. 63 gigabytes, that one customer just pretty much exhausted the RAM on a really powerful server. And even you can add indexes and so forth, but at the end of the day, you're going to get a lot of disk seeks storing this kind of data in a traditional database. And in the worst case, you know, just assuming say five milliseconds per seek and I'm trying to draw the data for two hours worth of time, you're looking at like 18 minutes on a traditional hard drive to draw that graph. That's not going to cut it, right? I mean, that's well above human perceptual threshold to say the least. <laughs> With the custom database that I'm about to tell you about, Little Table, it takes about two seconds to pull all that data. Wow. It's the funny thing about disks. If you read randomly all over them, it takes all day. If you somehow arrange the data just right, it streams at 100 megabytes a second, and you're solid. He's right. So um, <laughs> that was awesome. So another question that people sometimes ask is, well, why not just aggregate the data? OK, we do. Everybody aggregates data. It's good, right? It makes it so that you can show even more data. We can show a whole year you know, in a few seconds if we aggregate. But the problem is that aggregation actually hides useful information. Right? So here I've got a graph. This is a server that we used to have. I don't think it's in production anymore. Um, and an interface that we used to have that's also no longer in production because it aggregated. And here you can see this is load average, one minute load. And you can't read this number, but this is 30. And so that's about 40. And so right here, this server had a load of 40. And I think it had like. 12 CPUs or something like that. So this server was in a very unhappy place for a moment. Um, this is the same graph, but while this graph covers, I think, like eight hours or a day, this one covers a whole week. And what happened? Right? My little load spike is all gone. Why? Because I aggregated the data. It got averaged with all the points next to it, and it went away. Right? There's two problems with this. One, you're trying to figure out what went wrong with your network last week, and the data's gone. Right? It's just like, well, we remember seeing something bad, but we, you know, we couldn't afford to store it all, so we threw it away. From Meraki's point of view, in terms of like feature development, it's even worse. Right? We've got a whole bunch of engineers in a room. They're sitting around brainstorming, trying to think, what new features can we build? And they've got worlds of data. If they have that data at the raw resolution, they can go play with last month's data and say, hey, what would this have done if it had been running a month ago? What would it have been done if it had been running last year? And because we have this system, we can keep all that old data and try out new features on real customer data and like, get good ideas and then you know, build those features and ship them out. So an ideal statistics querying database works for queries that look something like this. This is an actual query. Um, this exists somewhere in our code base. Uh, so what I'm doing is saying, give me all the MAC addresses of all the clients on this network and the sum of amount of data that they've sent and received the name of the table is client transfer. It's not too surprising. There's a network ID. This is basically a customer ID. Um, and the timestamp was greater than two days ago and less than one day ago. So I basically want to see who transferred how much data yesterday. And I want you to group it by MAC address. Okay? It's nice. It's SQL. Almost all of our developers have learned a little SQL by the time they come to us. So being able to write queries in this forum is really quite nice. The tricks to getting this right are you have to keep the most commonly accessed data in RAM. 
right? If somebody's poking it at a thousand times a second, it's got to be right there. You can't go to disk for it. Moreover, you don't want to waste RAM on data you don't need. And this is where Postgres and MySQL fall short. They can hold the hot set in RAM. The problem is it's got all this other data that's from like three months ago mingled in. And so they end up filling up RAM with a bunch of data they don't need in order to get the data that they do. And then finally, if we do have to go to disk, we want to minimize seeks. We want to, as we were talking about earlier, just read contiguously right off the disk and get it all at once. So I have another animation. This one talks a bit about how little table works. So there's Poter and all of the grabbers that I was talking about before. And for the query that I just showed, we're getting tuples back that are something like network ID, MAC address, the time at which we gathered the data, and how much was sent and how much was received. In memory, we have little table, and it's storing ordered trees. These are you know, your standard binary tree that you learn about in Intro to Computer Science. Each one of these records goes into a bin as we get it, and it's sorted by network ID and MAC. So basically just this thing sorted in order. They keep coming in, and eventually we fill up a buffer. So it's fixed size, say, 10 megabytes. As soon as that happens, we start writing it to disk, again in sorted order. And we allocate a new buffer and start filling that up. Now say at this point a query comes in, like the one I just showed, and says, hey, give me everything for this particular network. Well, because these things are sorted by network ID, it's really easy to jump to the right spot in each map, get the data that I want, and then I can just kind of merge them together and send the result back out. At the same time, eventually I'm going to have to take this and move it out of memory. So I've written it to disk, and then at the end of this disk file, I store a little index that says, OK, this particular network ID and MAC, they occur right here in the file. And then a little, note, little other one that says, this ID and that MAC, they occur here in this file. So now if I get a query and I've thrown it out of memory, all I have to do is read this little footer, and that tells me right where to jump within this file. And because they're sorted by network ID, I can get all the data for one network very quickly. And again, I can merge that with the data in memory. What percentage of your writes are, are these index chunks? Um, the index chunks are pretty small, and they're very cacheable. They tend to get hit again and again, right? So we write them out once when we first write this. We call these tablets. We write them out once. We never write them again. These tablets are read-only. Um, and then we'll pull them back into an in-memory cache, generally. So usually to read data off disk, it's a single seek to the right spot in the file. Um, eventually, this gets written out with its own index. We start filling up this other one, and it gets written out. So at this point, to answer any given query, I need one seek to get to the right spot in each file. And then that gives me the right data for that network. And then I just merge as they come in off disk. It's quite efficient. Moreover, there's this interesting property. If you paid attention to the way the animation went, all of the data that's in this file came in between T0 and T1 two times. And the data that's in this file came in after T1, right? after I started writing this thing to disk. And it stops at T2. Likewise, the data for that file. So say this file represents yesterday. And this file is today, and that file is you know, two days ago. Somebody comes in and says, just tell me about yesterday. It's only one seek. Right? I only need to read the file for the day that I'm interested in. If I get a whole month, it's 30 files, but it's not 365. Right? Another interesting thing is that I can merge the actual files and write the result back to disk. So eventually, we have data, say it's a week old. We don't want to store it in day size buckets anymore, because we're not going to query it in day size buckets very often. So what we do is we read these things off disk streaming. They're all in order. And we can merge them and write them back out to disk with a fixed amount of memory. So we can very efficiently keep this thing up to date and able to query even over really large time scales. What are those cycles, day, week, month, year? I mean, that you do that? Yeah, it's, it's roughly that. So they, they actually get flushed about every 10 minutes just for durability if you get a sudden power outage. We can lose the most frequent set of statistics without harm. Because as soon as the machine comes back up, it talks right back to the APs that still have the statistics stored. So it's OK to be a little bit, but you do want to flush them out after about 10 minutes. Um, we aggregate them up into hour size chunks from hour into day, from day into seven day. And then not exactly month, but 28 day, because it's an even multiple of seven, so it makes the merging nice. Um, and then after that, I don't think we aggregate anymore. It stops at 28 days. 
And then there's like a maximum file size as well, which is like, I think it's two gigabytes because originally we couldn't, uh, we didn't want to mess with 64-bit file pointers. So, um, in terms of throughput, we get amazing throughput out of this thing. So this is on a single RAID 1 disk array. Queries come in at 40 megabytes a second, even with really, really tiny rows. Um, I'm not aware of commercial databases getting anywhere near this on a single disk. Uh, and inserts are also really fast, eight megabytes a second that we can store data into this thing. Um, in practice, we very rarely have to hit those. Uh, like the long-term average over the course of a day is much lower. But when somebody starts really poking on a bunch of data for a network and drilling down, you'll start to see really fast read rates in practice. All right. Um, I hope that was an interesting kind of insight into some of our technology. Uh, what I wanted to say a bit about feature development, I kind of already said, in that we can gather all this data. We can build these things to gather even more of it really quickly, and we can store it kind of indefinitely, even if we don't really know exactly what the feature is going to look like at first. Right? And because we're not limited by how much we can store, we can iterate on that design. And I think that's actually kind of a, it's taken us a while to figure out that that was as cool as it really was. Right? Because at first you were just trying to build something you already knew what you were trying to build. Right? But it's great when you bring on a new employee and you're like, hey, we've got all this data. Why don't you build a graph for it in JavaScript? Or you're like, hey, the firmware has this handler that you could poke. Why don't you start storing that in little tables so that somebody else could build a graph? And stuff like that. Um, questions? Yeah. Uh, so you touched on how it's got some resiliency that the AP will kind of cache some mm -hmm. statistics while the shard comes down and goes back. Yep. How long can that AP cache before it starts? A pretty running? long time. The actual, um, our APs have a lot of memory on purpose. When you're trying to do things like traffic analysis, you want to be able to cache you know, lots of interesting information. Um, it's also the case that customers' uplinks sometimes go down, and the AP needs to be able to you know, store all that data while the uplink isn't there, right? Because the AP can't talk to the back end at that point. So um, I don't know the exact number, but it's not generally a problem. <clears throat> like I said, originally we were poking them every 10 minutes. You know, and now we're hitting them every 45 seconds. So 10 minutes is easy. I assume that you've designed these databases to be redundant across the various different data centers that Meraki is running through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, when I talked at first, each shard is a, a 1U server, but it has a buddy in a different data center. And they basically do log shipping between the databases so that you have a kind of a consistent copy <coughs> on the other, um, in the other data center. So even if one shard has gone down, they can still query the same data from the yeah, other. Yeah, exactly. If a shard goes down, we immediately just fail over to the spare. And the spare starts collecting statistics from the access points. The customers get redirected to the spare. We provision a new spare in the other data center and immediately bring it back up, too. Have you thought about doing any deeper analytics from it or tying it All the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I don't think I'm allowed to talk about future features. <laughs> but um, yes, we constantly sit around and think about what I, really. I mean, that was the most, we do quite a lot of SIM within uh, my company. And that, that was, seems to me to be an obvious use for that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. How are you storing this data in terms of privacy for customer data? Are you encrypting this in the database as well? Is this, or is this an unencrypted data in the database that only certain people have master keys to? Yeah. on the. On the servers itself, it's unencrypted, um, just because you know it's a speed thing. Um, the data centers themselves are SAS 70, so forth compliant, biometric, and all that sort of stuff. Um, we do store it offsite for like tertiary backup in case both, like it would be a, an incredible coincidence for shard and spare to go down at the same time. But you know you want to think about it, and so we do store it offsite, and that's all encrypted um, and protected in that way. So to the to that point, kind of. Double question, mm -hmm. um, just based on something I ran into. The way you're doing your stuff. Well, first of all, you're in Europe. I'm assuming with a, with a data center actually in Europe. Mm -hmm. We have then, one in Europe. Um, the way it's stored, you know, kind of to Blake's point there, um, that's all compliant with anything the EU would care about as far as. Best of my knowledge, yeah. I mean, we're not we're not doing the sort of things that generally fall. <coughs> I mean, just storage and encryption and protection of. You know, blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. We also have uh, a lot of retail customers, and they're very conscious about PCI compliance. Yeah, that's true. Regulations. So we go through a lot of, so Sean's team is definitely a background check and sort of an access. And so the EU uh, data security directives are kind of a subset of that. But we're compliant with all of those. We do a lot of 
And at one point, I tried to fish out anything that said that in documentation, and there just was nothing hmm. um, to yeah. satisfy one of our centers. In yeah, Europe. if you need an audit report, um, contact either okay. on the wireless or something else, and we'll get one. Yeah. very comprehensive one. They're very, very large. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and there has been some criticism of that of Meraki gathering this, this kind of data and things, but it's, it's actually really good for you to, to be very open about this one from my point of view. I'm sure other people want to hear that as well, and also to, to hear that you've got those compliance constraints. Mm -hmm. And our privacy policy, everything, we, we try to put it up there. I mm -hmm. think there's always, whenever something's new, there's kind of questions around it. So we try to be transparent. That's what the audits are for. We have the, the, the pen testing and stuff like that. So we're, we're pretty public on that. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty clear that you guys are trying to develop a multi-tenant cloud application and that you're not like a Wi-Fi company that just happens to be throwing something in the cloud. And that's really, really critical because as, as everybody's saying here, yeah, the, the security and uh, security matters a lot. <laughs> implications are huge. So, And maybe that explains some of what you were talking about earlier in terms of what Cisco's trying to get out of Meraki. Um, you know, this could be valuable beyond managing access points. Yeah, I'd like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys very much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you.